Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bill. I had not expected my Fall River heritage to feature in the uh, uh, introduction, but uh, as most of you could just imagine, uh, it was certainly a great pleasure uh, working with Bill uh, over these last years, and um, our paths will cross more here, I'm sure, at Carnegie, but to be honest, they cross more often than I had thought, uh, still back in the, uh, some of the old haunts, and uh, Bill did a, did a great job, as you, as you, as you know. The, uh, uh, I know this conference is looking at uh, you know, a very broad variety of uh, nuclear topics, uh, from security of the fuel cycle, uh, vulnerable materials around the world, uh, to nuclear deterrence. The Department of Energy you know, has a similarly broad portfolio uh, of all things nuclear, uh, even as we lead in areas uh, for the government, in areas like you know, clean energy technology, um, uh, basic physical science uh, research, uh, but about two-thirds uh, of, uh, of our budget uh, is devoted to advancing America's nuclear security and cleaning up uh, the legacy of past nuclear arms uh, development. President Obama's uh, 2015, January 2015, uh, nuclear security strategy uh, stated uh, that, uh, that no threat poses uh, as grave a danger to our security and well-being as the potential use of nuclear weapons uh, and materials by irresponsible states or terrorists. But, and that threat, as people here know very well, is not static. Uh, last quarter century has witnessed uh, dramatic shifts in the global nuclear security environment. Cold War has ended, but thousands of nuclear weapons uh, in large stockpiles of weapons usable materials uh, remain. Geopolitical instability and sources of potential conflict uh, persist, especially in countries and regions, uh, with an active and, in, and indeed often growing uh, terrorist presence. Uh, new technology and manufacturing processes uh, continue to emerge, sometimes without a full understanding of the potential security risks that they may involve, dual use items, 3D printing, uh, you name it. The uh, concerns about climate change and rising demand for clean energy. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, risk increasing dislocations, and on the other, uh, have led in many, uh, many areas at least, to growing interest in nuclear power and fuel cycle development, uh, uh, and that in, in, including uh, research reactors. Consequently, an increasing number of countries with little to no experience in nuclear technology will be faced with the tasks of safely and securely managing nuclear facilities and protecting nuclear materials, including spent nuclear fuels. Finally, the emergence of additional nuclear-capable or nuclear threshold states, such as North Korea and Iran, is challenging the fundamental principles of the global nuclear nonproliferation regime. Our National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA, uh, headed by our Undersecretary and Administrator uh, for Nuclear Security, Frank Klotz, who I believe is here somewhere, uh, uh, is tasked with ensuring uh, that America's nuclear weapons uh, remain safe, secure, and effective without testing, while working to combat proliferation, secure vulnerable materials, prevent nuclear terrorism, and respond to potential nuclear disasters. Further, our Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program ensures reliable operation of the Navy's nuclear-powered fleet, including 73 submarines and 10 aircraft carriers. Our Office of Nuclear Energy, organizationally, under the Undersecretary for Science and Energy, is working to support the next generation of advanced nuclear reactors, including small modular reactors, while ensuring that our current fleet has the technology needed to remain safe and efficient, and advancing viable consent-based nuclear waste solutions. The work on nuclear fuel cycles clearly intersects the nonproliferation agenda and collaboration between nuclear energy and NN, uh, in fact, is both essential and quite, and quite active. And the, uh, the weapons cleanup program that I, that I referred to earlier in the budget uh, is under the Undersecretary for Management and Performance. But all I want to emphasize there is that uh, this broad nuclear agenda at DOE engages all three undersecretaries, NNSA, Science and Energy, Management and Performance. And that's why recently we established, and I personally chair, uh, a new Nuclear policy, policy Council that provides a venue for senior folks at DOE uh, to exchange ideas on cross-cutting nuclear issues uh, and to charge appropriate policy development. 
excuse me, uh, too much travel. <laughs> let, me, let me turn to the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, as we work to fulfill the global demand uh, for affordable, reliable, and carbon-free energy, nuclear energy clearly has an important role to play uh, here in America, we think, and, and around the world. Today, it's, it accounts for more than 80% of carbon-free electricity uh, in the United States. And last year, the United States nuclear fleet produced 90% of its maximum generating capacity, the highest level ever recorded. However, we also have to consider carefully uh, the nuclear fuel cycle, both from a national security perspective and also from the energy security perspective. Let me start with national security. I know that the P5 plus 1 negotiations with Iran are in the minds of many here, and I can't say much specific about this now, but I did spend all of last week uh, in Switzerland as part of the U.S. delegation uh, headed by John Kerry, Secretary Kerry, to the Iranian uh, nuclear negotiations. These negotiations, again led by the state and the White House, draw upon other agencies in their areas of expertise, and not surprisingly, that includes the Department of Energy. DOE is able to draw upon a vast scientific and technical uh, uh, expertise base from across our national laboratories and other sites. Uh, the, so I just wanted to emphasize that, frankly, while you know, our role has become uh, more uh, visible uh, over, the last, uh, over the last month, um, I just want to emphasize that the department uh, has been engaged uh, all throughout these negotiations, uh, providing extensive technical advice and input to underpin our negotiating position. Almost 10 labs and sites, in fact, have been called upon uh, in supporting uh, the various uh, positions that the United States has called upon to analyze in these negotiations. For example, uh, DOE has done analyses of Iran's nuclear fuel cycle in order to provide technical recommendations on topics like enrichment, R&D, and breakout timelines. Similarly, the, uh, the Iraq reactor and the plutonium pathway to a weapon uh, has, been, uh, has been analyzed. Uh, the analysis is, is, is rigorous and central to the discussions because we need, we need to be very clear, uh, uh, and the international community needs to be very clear about what we are getting uh, in uh, technical dimensions of a possible uh, agreement. On the Iranian side, I want to uh, emphasize that uh, Dr. Ali Salehi, head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, also joined, joined the talks, in effect, putting the heads of both countries' nuclear organizations uh, at the table. That's all I can say about the negotiations at this point, but our engagement in these talks is, again, just one example of the Department's deep involvement in the security of the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, and as you know, the discussions will resume uh, within days. Of course, nonproliferation is only one piece of the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, these efforts go hand in hand with the Department of Energy's work to increase the energy security of nuclear energy as well. The U.S. has enforced uh, 22 civil nuclear cooperation agreements with 49 partners, fostering the development of over 70 gigawatts of clean nuclear power worldwide. These agreements not only facilitate access to the safest and most advanced civil nuclear technology commercially available, but ensure that transfers of U.S. technology are consistent with U.S. nonproliferation commitments uh, and the highest safety and security standards. And linking back to the nonproliferation discussion, uh, we work through these agreements to encourage our partners to rely on the global market uh, to fuel these reactors rather than pursuing indigenous enrichment and reprocessing capabilities. DOE backstops these agreements with physical fuel assurances through the American Assured Fuel Supply, a bank containing 17 metric tons uh, of LEU fuel which U.S. partners may draw upon in the event of a supply interruption. These measures contribute to the security of the fuel cycle and the energy security of our partners. Ukraine offers an important example of how diversity increases security. There's been widespread coverage regarding Ukrainian reliance on Russian natural gas and, of course, European reliance on gas as well. But what many don't realize or think about is that Ukraine uh, relies upon nuclear power for half of its electricity 
And of course, the nuclear fuel uh, for those reactors was 100% uh, sourced in Russia, uh, supplying Russian origin reactor uh, technologies. When Ukraine gained independence from the Soviet Union, the only manufacturer of fuel suitable for their reactors was, was Russia. Uh, again, a situ and a situation that is replicated in a number of other countries. So after independence in 1991, U.S. experts from the Department of Energy began working with Ukraine to address its lack of fuel market options for its Soviet design reactors, which represent approximately half, again, of the country's uh, total uh, electricity generation. In 99, the Ukrainian government formally requested U.S. assistance to develop additional nuclear fuel supply options, which led to a formal agreement in 2000 to qualify a U.S. vendor as an alternative nuclear fuel supplier. The government chose Westinghouse through a competitive process to design and manufacture the fuel assemblies. The research went forward with little fanfare uh, as Westinghouse, US, U.S. National Lab personnel, uh, and their Ukrainian counterparts worked together to design a Western fuel assembly that could work in a Russian designated, a uh, Russian designed, excuse me, uh, reactor uh, with Russian and Western uh, fuel. In 2005, we began testing assemblies in one reactor at the South Ukraine nuclear power plant. By 2009, Westinghouse fuel began commercial qualification side by side with Russian fuel, and by 2014, all of the Westinghouse commercial assemblies had operated successfully without issues. The research and development cost was around $70 million over the lifetime of the project. But the return on that investment is many times over that initial investment. Today, Ukraine has an alternative vendor for its nuclear fuel. Uh, other countries with Russian designated reactors have, uh, Russian design reactors, I keep saying that, uh, have a viable and reliable choice of vendors and Westinghouse has the opportunity to finalize contracts abroad, uh, and this could mean an increase in U.S. manufacturing jobs. Russia's influence over Ukraine's access to nuclear fuel is only part of the energy security equation. Nuclear waste was in many ways equally important. If Russia stopped removing the used fuel after a period of time, Ukrainian reactors would not be able to operate due to a buildup of used nuclear fuel. Another outcome of the agreement with Ukraine is a contract uh, with another U.S. company, Holtec International, to build a used fuel storage facility inside Ukraine. The construction cost for the Holtec facility is estimated uh, at about $300 million, meaning the facility will pay for itself in less than two years. An in-country storage facility, uh, again, gives Ukraine an option, the option to pay Russia to take back used fuel or to store that used fuel locally diversifying its options. This, this, this reminds me, of course, reminds us <coughs> of the importance of making progress on the disposition of nuclear spent fuel and high-level waste. Russia's willingness for spent fuel return of Russian origin fuel can be an important nonproliferation advantage, basically an approach to what is sometimes called fuel leasing while additionally providing them potentially competitive advantage. So we need to diversify not just supply, but in this case, we need, we need diversification of uh, nuclear waste disposal uh, as well. And that, of course, remains a challenge in many parts of the world, including the United States. The bottom line uh, is that the Ukraine example of what two countries can do to realize substantial security of supply and energy security market enhancements is an important one. When talking about Russia, it's important to remember our larger strategic relationship. At the Department of Energy, this relationship is rooted in science, uh, and science historically has been a vehicle of collaboration, even when political relationships have been difficult. And there have been significant difficulties. However, we hope that our shared trust and expertise in science will allow us to continue some, at least some, of our nuclear security work with Russia, despite the current political climate, and hopefully to resume more activity should circumstances allow. As a major nuclear power, Russia remains an essential element of the global effort to address the threat posed by nuclear terrorism. 
Despite current differences, we are ready to continue to work as partners in areas of mutual interest. For example, we have worked with Russia to eliminate over 2,000 kilograms of HEU from over a dozen countries around the world. Earlier this year, uh, NNSA, the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, and the IAEA cooperated to return 36 kilograms of Russian origin HEU spent fuel from Kazakhstan to Russia. And last fall, we worked together uh, to remove HEU from Poland. Uh, all of this happening, uh, obviously, at a time of great tension. As we look forward in the 21st century, we must continue to drive international cooperation around nuclear security, irrespective of complicating factors. Ultimately, it's in all of our interests to ensure that we reduce the threat of nuclear terrorism and proliferation. The United States will continue to work with Russia in the areas that we can, and I hope that our Russian counterparts will commit to a meaningful dialogue going forward. Let me return to the Department of Energy's nonproliferation efforts more broadly. Today, I'm very pleased to, to announce uh, the release of a new report titled uh, Prevent, Counter, and Respond, a Strategic Plan to Reduce Global Nuclear Threats. It exists, and I believe there will be copies uh, out back uh, and on our website um, uh, within minutes. Um, for the first time, um, the, uh, in a single document, the Department is articulating our programs to reduce the threat of nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism, uh, including uh, where we see the program developing, heading over the next several years. And I want to congratulate uh, Frank Klotz and Madeline Creeden, and especially Ann Harrington, uh, for uh, bringing this together. I think it's, I think it's an important step uh, in, in our ability to, uh, to, again, to articulate uh, what are the dangers, what are the risks, what are the needs, what are the priorities as we go forward. I'll note this report uh, is in response to the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board's CAB's uh, Task Force on Nuclear Nonproliferation, uh, as was the formation uh, of the DOE Nuclear Policy Council that I mentioned earlier. I will note that CAB is uh, chaired by John Deutsch, the Nuclear Security Subgroup is headed by Brent Scowcroft, and the Nonproliferation Task Force is chaired by Al Carnesal, so it's a pretty good lineup of people who know something about the, nat the nuclear security uh, uh, issues. The report describes NNSA's strategic approach to build and sustain the capabilities required to prevent, counter, and respond to nuclear proliferation and nuclear radiological terrorism. This defense by other means strategy is built around three pillars that are laid out and, and, uh, and uh, elaborated considerably in the report. For, again, preventing, preventing non-state actors in additional countries from developing nuclear weapons and preventing non-state actors from acquiring radiological materials. Second, countering the efforts of both proliferant states and non-state actors to acquire, develop, or deliver the materials needed for a nuclear device. And third, responding to nuclear or radiological terrorist acts or accidents. <clears throat> Excuse me. The report, again, as I said, is now available outside the auditorium and for download from our website. So I won't go into much detail here. Uh, I hope it will inspire some conversation uh, over the rest of this, this important meeting. But I do want to lay out one important piece of both the report and our strategy towards funding and managing our nonproliferation, counterterrorism, and emergency response functions. Our FY16 budget request, uh, which went to the Congress in February, uh, proposed the transfer of the nuclear counterterrorism and incident response and the counterterrorism and counterproliferation programs from the weapons activities of NNSA to the Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation uh, Appropriation. This realignment uh, we, we feel will concentrate funding for reducing global nuclear dangers in one place. Uh, it will also consolidate funding for critical R&D to support counterterrorism, emergency response, and nonproliferation initiatives. The, restruct the restructuring cuts redundancies across programs, strengthens complementary missions, and we think provides greater clarity uh, on the 
uh, on, the, on the totality of the program uh, and the funding uh, requirements. So we think this change just makes sense. Uh, together, these programs execute one of NNSA's enduring missions to limit or counter the spread of weapons of mass destruction, advance technologies that detect the proliferation of weapons, eliminate or secure inventories of surplus materials, provide a trained response to incidents worldwide, and address hostile nations or terrorist groups that may acquire nuclear devices. In moving to, cl to close my remarks, uh, I'll emphasize that as you all know, the President has made eliminating and securing nuclear material, reducing nuclear stockpiles, and increasing global cooperation a pillar of his foreign policy. Last summer in Berlin, uh, the President echoed the vision he first put forward in his 2009 Prague speech, calling on the global community to secure vulnerable, vulnerable materials, decrease the number of nuclear weapons, and build a sustainable and secure nuclear energy industry. A critical driver of our nuclear security agenda has been President Obama's vision and particularly the nuclear security summit process that he launched in 2010. As the President has said himself, what's been most valuable about these summits is that they are resulting in concrete actions that make the world a safer place. The first summit was held in Washington uh, with 47 delegates, including 38 heads of state or government, the largest number convened by a U.S. President since the 1945 UN Conference on International Organization. In 2012, the second summit was held in Seoul, and the third summit was held uh, in The Hague in 2014. And President Obama has announced that he will host a fourth summit in the U.S. in 2016. One of the largest commitments made at a nuclear security summit was the pledge by the United States and Japan to remove and dispose of all HEU and separated plutonium from the fast critical assembly in Japan. The joint project involves the elimination of hundreds of kilograms of sensitive nuclear material to help prevent unauthorized actors, criminals, or terrorists from acquiring them. Earlier this month, I hosted Dr. Toyoshi Fuketa, Commissioner of the Japanese Nuclear Regulation Authority at DOE headquarters, to talk about how we can continue to move this towards completion. Our, our very positive discussion was the result of over a dozen meetings between U.S. and Japanese teams since the Hague Summit last year, during which our experts <coughs> have tackled and overcome a host of challenges. Indeed, we are still hoping that we will be able to launch uh, the, the return uh, of, this, of this material <coughs> in 2016. I use this example to demonstrate our commitment to making these, summit actions, these summits action-based meetings with clear deliverables coming out. I'll also note one other part of the Hague Summit <coughs> that was interesting, uh, a new approach to highlighting the nuclear challenge for leaders, namely a tabletop exercise uh, involving radiological sources. Uh, we need to keep thinking creatively about uh, how we elevate the priority of these nuclear security challenges, and that, I thought, was one um, uh, eye-opening exercise for leaders from, from many, many countries. So again, in closing today, I'll, I'll note that we covered a fair number of the topics on the nuclear security agenda, <clears throat> but today, at least not the uh, ma uh, maintenance of a safe and secure uh, and effective nuclear stockpile in the absence of testing. Uh, I know that Administrator Klotz uh, will participate in a panel this afternoon, uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll engage in those, in, the, in those discussions and how the Department of Energy's technical capabilities allow for a stockpile uh, that is safe, reliable, and effective without testing. I think uh, later on this year, we will also be, uh, I think, reflecting more on what I think is a remarkable achievement uh, for our national security namely the new paradigm that was established nearly 20 years ago called science-based stockpile stewardship. Uh, it is absolutely foundational to a no-test regime. Uh, the United States remains uh, committed to ratifying and entering into force the CTBT, which will lay the groundwork for a world with diminished reliance on nuclear weapons, reduced nuclear competition, and eventual nuclear disarmament. And I encourage you all 
to stay for that discussion that uh, uh, Frank Klotz will be engaged in, uh, as well as other exchanges at this conference. So let me again uh, say thank you to Carnegie uh, for hosting this important uh, conference, uh, and thank you all for your dedication uh, to these critical issues. Thank you. So Secretary Moniz has graciously agreed to stick around and take a few questions, uh, at least as long as his voice holds out, I suppose. Um, so I would ask that you please uh, line up. There will be a few people in each of the aisles that have microphones. I would ask that you uh, step to the, the microphones and uh, st please state your name, your affiliation, and ask briefly uh, your question or comments. Thank you, Secretary Moniz. My name is Jeannie Nguyen, with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Thank you for the very comprehensive plan you uh, expressed to us. I'd like to ask the importance of the outcome result regarding our relationship between Russia, China, the US, and especially what is going on now in Southeast Asia, including the Asia uh, rising power, India, Japan, and China, regarding the nuclear power, both in the changing of climate, climate change, the use of civil uh, nuclear powers, and also the potential um, use of nuclear in you know, war times, including the relationship between China and Iran. Thank you. A lot, of, a lot of territory to cover there. Well, <laughs> I will try to give a shorter answer uh, than the question. Um, <clears throat> well, okay, first, first of all, uh, uh, the issue of uh, nuclear power and climate change, uh, clearly uh, China in particular is stepping out with an enormous uh, nuclear, nuclear build, um, uh, although it still <laughs> is dwarfed in comparison uh, to, the, to their fossil fuel use uh, today. But I will just note there uh, that if, you, if we go back to the commitment uh, made by uh, President Xi uh, when, he met, when he and President Obama announced uh, climate uh, objectives uh, back in October, uh, uh, much attention is paid, rightfully, to the fact that China declared a, a, a peaking of of CO2 emissions, uh, but I would call attention to, the, to a second part of that announcement, which was a commitment to 20% carbon-free energy uh, by, 2030, by 2030. Uh, if you work out the arithmetic, that is a very substantial and challenging uh, commitment, uh, and nuclear power is certainly going to be a part of that, at least according to their plans. Uh, we did, uh, uh, we are uh, moving towards completing, uh, hopefully, the renewed one, two, three agreement with China and, and uh, we envision ongoing collaboration. Uh, let me just, uh, you asked many questions, so let me, let me just t talk a little bit about India. Uh, with India, uh, we, we, we are having many, many discussions about uh, particularly trying to get the administrative arrangement uh, uh, completed and, and address liability issues. Uh, we, we, see, we see movement there and, and hopefully uh, the agreement uh, between the United States and India uh, on nuclear collaboration is one that will uh, flower uh, in the next in the next couple of years. Let's take one over there. Stephen, uh, uh, Do Stephen Dolly with Platts. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the administration has chosen not to pursue a deep geological repository at Yucca, Yucca Mountain. Can you tell us briefly what tangible steps are being pursued? Uh, for development of a repository, and, and do you feel it's important for the U.S. to have active efforts to develop a repository to encourage other countries to do so, or is it sufficient to say, do as I say, not as I do? Well, as I said in my remarks, uh, the uh, uh, developing and, and carrying through on uh, uh, used uh, nuclear fuel and high-level waste uh, disposition uh, is quite is quite important. Uh, it's obviously important for nuclear power, 
but it also has, uh, perhaps in second order at least, uh, a, a non-proliferation uh, implication. Uh, things like uh, fuel leasing obviously cannot be, uh, cannot be carried out uh, without a, a suitable uh, disposal uh, pathway. Now, what we are doing, um, and uh, both are doing now and have in our fiscal year 16 uh, budget, uh, is fundamentally to move forward uh, the agenda that was set out initially by the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's nuclear future, and then by the administration statement of policy uh, in January 2013. Uh, it has a number of components. Uh, a very important one uh, is moving uh, we would like to say promptly uh, towards consolidated storage, uh, dry cask storage uh, of fuel. Last year, uh, such a, uh, an initiative uh, did pass uh, the Senate. Uh, I believe there's interest in, in revisiting that again this year, and we hope uh, get it across the finish line. Uh, uh, with regard to uh, also on um, high-level waste, I should note that uh, we did put out a report uh, last um, uh, fall, uh, October I believe it was, uh, on the issues of looking at uh, specific disposal pathways uh, for uh, high level waste from, from the nuclear weapons program. Uh, things like, uh, could be de a deep borehole approach for example for cesium strontium capsules from Hanford. Uh, very importantly, I think in our FY16 budget, in addition to carrying on the uh, technology uh, development and characterization work for three different geological media, uh, we have in there about $30 million to advance, uh, you might say, generic activities uh, towards consent-based nuclear disposal facilities. Uh, the, uh, we remain convinced, uh, as was the Blue Ribbon Commission, that the only way we're going to get over the finish line is through a consent-based process, and we will start a set of generic activities uh, in the FY, with, with the FY16 budget. Thank you. In the middle here, please. <coughs> Warren Stern, Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for an, an excellent introduction, which addressed a range of topics from safety, security, nonproliferation, emergency response. Um, in the bureaucracy, each of these topics is often addressed separately. Indeed, you talked about the Ukraine Fuels Qualification Program and the Spent Fuel um, Storage Program, which were part of our nuclear safety program. And often there's not interaction between the various disciplines. But, but as you noted, they're all, they all need to be integrated in policy. What are you doing to make sure, making, to make sure that at DOE each of these different topics are integrated into a, a nuclear whole, if you will, that they work together in a, a synergistic way? Well, really, two things that I mentioned already in my remarks. Uh, uh, one is uh, the, uh, the reorganization of the nonproliferation office, uh, including the uh, integration into it of some of the counterterrorism and uh, nuclear response efforts. Uh, the, the, the organization is now much more along functional lines. Some people were unhappy that some of their favorite uh, names uh, may, not have, may not be so prominent anymore. Uh, but um, if you look at that, I think you will see a, a very logical uh, kind of functional organization. But secondly, I do want to emphasize again the Nuclear Policy Council that we, that we uh, uh, created recently. We've had one quarterly meeting so far, and there have been some, task, some taskings. It explicitly recognizes the issue that you have raised. And, I, and as I said, we have, when we look at all things nuclear, all three of our undersecretaries have major responsibilities. It's not just NNSA. Uh, and so this provides now a forum where we are specifically looking uh, at how we draw upon our capabilities, many of which are in the labs, uh, uh, to look at cross-cutting issues. Again, the obvious one I discussed today, the nuclear fuel cycle is both a nuclear energy and a nuclear security uh, issue. Uh, and so we now have a, a forum uh, where we can look at this in a more integrated way across the, across the enterprise, and hopefully that will lead to some specific actions uh, in gaps that otherwise might, uh, might have existed. Take a question over here. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Jeff Brumfield with National Public Radio. 
I was wondering what technical aspect of the Iranian program has taken up most of your department's time, or what's been the most, required the most analysis? And then also, what aspect of the program worries you personally the most? Sorry, could you re repeat the last part? Sure, well, sure. So the first part is just what technical aspect yeah. has taken the most time, and then what part of the program worries you personally the most? Oh. Well, let me just say that the, uh, uh, there are, you know, there are, we've always said that there are multiple pathways uh, to a weapon should, should Iran choose to, to pursue them, um, two involving uh, uranium, uh, one involving plutonium, and one in terms of covert activity. So that, that's the way the rack-up has been done. Uh, we cannot emphasize one over another. We need to address uh, all of these pathways, and, and we are doing so. Uh, in terms of the technical dimensions, uh, again, it's, I think it's pretty straightforward having said that. Uh, one is around enrichment, um, uh, and enrichment R&D, uh, and, uh, and the second is around uh, uh, rea reactor production of plutonium. So th those are the technical dimensions that we, we have been analyzing, we are analyzing, uh, and that we are discussing, and that's really as about as far as I'll go yep. uh, at the moment. We'll take one last question in the middle here, and then unfortunately the secretary will have to run. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> François Géry from France. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you have mentioned uh, the importance of um, uh, nuclear facilities in Ukraine. Could you tell us in this country, uh, which is in a situation of serious uh, military crisis, what are the measures which has been taken or envisaged in order to secure uh, nuclear facilities in that country against possible terrorist action or possible uh, militia actions? Thank you. Well, the physical, physical protection of these facilities is you know, largely the responsibility of, of the Ukrainian government. Uh, uh, certainly in the areas in which it has uh, current control. Uh, we know there are uh, obviously issues uh, and challenges for the international uh, community in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, safeguards certification in, the pla in, in, in Crimea, uh, for example, uh, would be a <laughs> rather difficult problem at the moment. Uh, the, uh, what, again, what we have been involved in mainly is, one thing I did not mention is that the department uh, has uh, worked uh, very closely with other, with other agencies as well of the government, including FEMA, uh, Red Cross, et cetera. Uh, uh, the department has, through its energy emergency response capability, uh, uh, and, and I should also say, always in partnership with the European Commission, uh, we, have, we helped the Ukraine government develop its energy contingency plan uh, for the winter, uh, this past winter, uh, and, uh, and of course there will be remaining challenges going forward. That is broad-based, uh, natural gas, electricity, coal supply, nuclear, nuclear power. Uh, in the nuclear realm, the one tangible uh, 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 result has been the commitment to diversify the fuel supply, as I said, uh, involving Westinghouse, uh, now producing uh, fuel assemblies uh, for uh, uh, Ukrainian reactors. Well, it's 945 and the secretary has a hard stop. Uh, so please join me in thanking him for his time today. Thank you very much. Thank you.